Okay, I spent some time trying to think of what title I give for this section because we go from one extreme to the other. We go from old vintage logs to very new logs. And just to back up what Bill was saying, old logs will always be with us and leave economic value. The chart books, for example, that used to be published in the old days and are no longer available, they have them issued then on CDs from the Rocky Mountain Association of Geologists, which tells you two things that yes, you can dig into these older logs, and secondly, people are spending money to make sure that they are available for your use. Now we go to the other extreme though, and I thought, what shall I call these logs? Now usually when the kind of logs that I'm going to talk about run in Kansas, they're typically referred to as exotic logs. So I guess that makes me an exotic log analyst then, but don't tell my wife. She'll think there's something very strange going on. But I won't call them exotic because, yeah, they're unusual in Kansas, but I think if you went down to Texas and told them about exotic logs, they would have a good laugh. They're still laughing after Baylor crushed Kansas, so I don't want even more laughter. Well, I could call them another thing. I call them expensive log because, yeah, they cost money. So you need to seriously think about if you decide to run them, whether or not you're going to do them. But as we review these logs, do recall that there will come times when you actually come across one of these logs run in a nearby well. And if somebody else has paid for it, why shouldn't you look at it? Furthermore, there might be some instances where you're dealing with a tough reservoir to the point you're thinking, well, maybe we'll take a call. That costs money. The reason you take a call is because you want to try and get to grips with your reservoir. So that might be a strategy too, that you say there will come times when I'm prepared to pony up for one of these expensive logs so that I can get to grips in that well and using information from my logging here, I can use it in the remaining wells. So I finally decide the gentle one, enhanced logging. Vintage logs pre-1958, and then we'll have the millennial logs, I call it enhanced logging. And we'll take some examples then of what we've seen then in Kansas. So we're going to look at borehole imaging, magnetic resonance, and even geochemical logs. This is the title page sent from the log analyst, and this is back in March, April of 1997. So since it's on the cover then, one won't say it's exotic, but nevertheless it, it's cutting edge at that point. That's why they put it on the cover. And I particularly like it because what we see here is fundamentally a sandstone, and I can see so much information on the two logs we're going to be talking about to start with. Over here on the left, we have an image which shows then fundamentally we've got some sandstone down here, we've got some shale layers, interbedded sandstones and shales, and finally going to the shale. And over here on the right, we have the results then from a nuclear magnetic resonance log, which is actually partitioning then the pore space into different sized pores. So the aspect there that we'll be looking at is the one hand on the imaging, we can actually see at a phenomenally high resolution what's going on in the borehole wall instead of it being averaged over an interval of, say, two feet. Then, on the other hand, as we look in the pore space, we've got two possible outputs. One is maybe an estimate of permeability, which was a big selling point of the nuclear magnetic resonance log. Also, our partitioning the pore size, we can finally crack open which of the fluid is movable and which is immobile, which is an important aspect. So well, let's look at some examples. Okay, we'll start off with the imaging. And what we have here on this slide is concept in that along with the results of the image, we see these tadpoles. And these look like the output of a dip meter run. And essentially that's what the imaging is. It's a super souped up dip meter log. It just goes from the old concept then of using dip meters, which are locating the dips and strikes of features within a borehole, and going whole hog and saying, well, let's image the entire borehole wall. And dip meters have been around a long time in Kansas. They've been used. And this is what it looked like back in 1965. That time, we actually had Slum J here in Wichita, and they were doing some logging out there, particularly um, on the Cherokee and things like that. And we'll see some examples. Fundamentally, here's the process, and that is we have the tool itself, 
It's a four-arm dip meter, so we have four arms arranged at 90 degrees to one another. We have a pad, and on the pad we have an electrode. So fundamentally what's going on is we have a microresistivity measurement, but we have four of them. It's just simply they range radially about the, the tool housing there. And so here's an example then of what was run back then. We are back in the 60s, in fact, and we're looking at a pretty shallow hole. So you can see 500 feet, 600 feet. Here's our gamma ray. Counts per second, it shows how old things are. But fundamentally, a shale here, and then here's a Bartlesville sandstone section they drilled into. Now they drilled this, they got oil production out of this in this hole, and they went with a dip meter. The issue here was why they were doing it, is they wanted to know where to locate the next well. So we're looking at an area then that has shoestring sands. So it's kind of rather like kind of pin the tail on the donkey of where do you pin the next hole. Now it's my understanding, and I'm pretty gullible, I'm told that back then it was not uncommon to hire an oil witch to do it for you. You didn't have that far to drill, so whatever. Pay somebody 20 bucks to go out with a hazel twig and find it. Maybe they were good at it. I'm not going to judge on that. Or, I suppose back then you could have tried to run seismic, but that's awfully expensive to run on something you're trying to find that's only 650 feet down. So instead they were running the dip meter because what they were looking for was drape of the shales above the sandstone. Now this particular area you can by mapping, and this has been shown by a number of people, if you start to do mapping of some of the thin limestones up section, you can actually pick up some structural drape then over these sandstone bodies. And that means that actually the sandstone body very commonly has this kind of surface, a convex upward surface done by compactional drape. So by structural draping we're thinking about compaction features rather than structured tectonics. So that our issue then is that what we're picking up is if we have a sandstone body down there which is fairly rigid under compaction and we've got the shales compacting above it, then our model says that actually the shales above, immediately above the sandstone will be compacted and pick up the dip and strike then of the, the surface, the top surface of that sandstone. So let's check it out. Right at the top, we'll start off with the dips here and you can see here's the range 0 to 20, so very minor dips, the top hardly any dip at all. In fact, if you put it on a polar plot, there's just really not going in any direction at all. Zero dip would be right in the middle. As we move down the section, things start to kick up a little bit, but not much is going on until finally we get to this section here, which is the shell right on top of the sandstone. And you can see now that there's definitely a tendency then to dips going towards the west. And also this outer circle here is about 15 degrees, which is pretty heavy duty dip for this particular area. Then as we go into the sandstone, we're picking actually dips which are going to the south. And then we get the shell below the sandstone and it's going back to nothing. So I have a model here then that what this suggests in this particular well is that you are picking up dips on the upper surface going to the west, suggesting then that you are on the western flank of this sandstone body, that the axis in this, around this well is going north-south, that sandstone body, which is kind of cool because that suggests maybe these are picking up sedimentary features within the sand, and that if you wanted to drill further development wells, well, get a little thicker, head a little bit to the east, and then pick up on the north-south. So that's a one of the wells. Well, that's number four actually, so that's that one right there. In fact, in this particular location, and this is back then in 65 to 66, they drilled a succession of wells starting off with number one, dry hole. And they've got to dip in this direction so that, okay, we'll head in up this way. And then you see a succession of wells that are drilled. Some are productive, some are not. They don't run the dip meter in all the wells, but here they're trying to pick up the axis then of the body to fill it out. <coughs>